Hello, and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center AASHTO Bike Guide Series webinar. Today's webinar is titled, Off-Road Facilities, Shared Use Path Design, and we, will speak, and we will be speaking with Eric Mongelli, PE, Director of Engineering at Tool Design Group, and Tom Huber, Senior Planner, also at Tool Design Group. My name is James Gallagher, and I am the PBIC Communications Manager. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I'd like to welcome and thank Eric and Tom for their presentations today. We will take questions at the end. Eric and Tom, please take it from here. Um, okay, well, I want to welcome those uh, folks who are, are coming back and have seen our prior webinars, and also like to welcome uh, new audience members. As James said, this is the fifth in a series of seven webinars that are uh, covering the new AASHTO Bike Guide. And today's webinar will focus on shared use path design. We'll be covering the basics of shared use paths and then getting into some of the details of uh, geometric design for paths. So uh, during the webinar, we'll actually be having a conversation on Twitter. And if you'd like to participate, um, please join uh, at Tool Design. And to keep the discussion focused uh, on the bike guide, please use the hashtag AASHTO or bike guide. It's kind of a fun way to participate in the discussion uh, that will be going on around the US during the webinar. Also, our, our tool design staff will be tweeting some of the main points of the webinar as we go along. So um, this webinar, again, will focus on the basics of shared use path design. Um, and we'll be talking about uh, various design considerations. We'll be mentioning some of the significant updates in the guide uh, from the prior Ashtabike guide. We'll get into the purpose, uh, the users, locations of shared use paths. Uh, the, the new guide has a much expanded discussion of side paths. We'll define what those are and, and pros and cons. And then we'll get into the details of, of geometric design, talking about path widths and clearances. Uh, design speed, how that's determined and how it factors into other design elements. We'll talk about horizontal and vertical alignments, slopes, uh, stopping site distance considerations, and we'll touch on some other considerations such as uh, pavement design, uh, bridges and underpasses, and drainage and lighting. So. Um, Again, this is the fifth webinar. Uh, the last two webinars uh, in our series focused on on-road bicycle facilities. And the one prior to that talked about uh, the planning aspects of bicycle transportation. And we're not going to repeat the content of those webinars. We're now moving forward into chapter five of the guide, which uh, is the path design chapter. And we've split that into two webinars, uh, this one and then the next one, which will be October 23rd and we'll focus on path and roadway intersections and also talk about uh, signing and marking for paths. So as uh, James mentioned, uh, there is a, a discount for purchasing the guide uh, for, for the webinar attendees. This is the link um, to get to the discount. Uh, if you want to get a, get on a jump on it, you can copy this down. Uh, but as James mentioned, the, this uh, information will be emailed out to the webinar attendees. So just a little repeat from the previous webinars, but it's important to understand uh, the basics of AASHTO and how it relates to other guides. So AASHTO is a, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide techn technical support to states to help them efficiently and safely safely move uh, people and goods. So AASHTO develops a set of uniform guidelines for transportation design. And just a little history on the bike guide. The, the previous bike guide was uh, published in 1999 and was largely written uh, between 1996 and 1998. The new guide um, reflects a lot of research and innovation that's happened over the last 15 years. And the new guide is about twice uh, the size of the previous guide. A couple key things to understand is the, is the difference between standards and guidance. Standards are, are required in manuals such as the MUTCD and use terms such as shall. Uh, they're, they're standards because they're adopted through federal law, where AASHTO issues guidance and uses terms such as should or may. And AASHTO guidance can be deviated from using engineering judgment for site-specific situations 
But many times states and localities uh, will adopt those guidelines as standards and many times will add additional detail to, to ASHTO guidelines. Another key to understand is the difference between innovation and accepted practice. Innovation is allowed in the METCD and ASHTO through a formal experimentation process that's outlined in the METCD. And at, over time, as innovative treatments are experimented with, they become accepted practice and can eventually make it into the METCD and or uh, ASHTO. So briefly talk about the relationship to some other manuals. I've mentioned METCD. We'll talk about the ASHTO Green Book in, in just a minute. Um, another one that's particularly important for path design is um, the U.S. Access Board's uh, PROAG. Uh, access accessibility requirements are enacted by law similar to the METCD and need to be adhered to. Another manual that's out there is the Highway Capacity Manual. Um, and that really comes into play more for on-road bicycle facilities. Uh, so it doesn't really come into play with uh, shared use path design. Another guide that's out there, a relatively new guide uh, that was developed by large urban cities, the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide, um, is, a, is primarily for on-road facilities and includes a, a several experimental uh, facilities. It's a great source of information for those treatments. And once those treatments go through the experimentation process that I mentioned earlier and the design details and safety implications uh, become clear, the next step would be to incorporate uh, those treatments into AASHTO. And uh, we really think of ASHTO and NACTO as complementary. There are a number of treatments in NACTO that are not covered in ASHTO and vice versa. ASHTO covers, um, goes into much more detail on design principles and uh, covers paths and off-road facilities. NACTO does not. So it's not really an either or. It's, uh, it's considered them using them both. The Ashton Green Book really comes into play with shared use path design. Um, shared use paths follow design follows the principles of roadway design, using items such as design speed and horizontal and vertical curvature, cross slope and site distances is all based on the principles of roadway design. Many of the uh, the formulas in the uh, Ashton Bike Guide for path design are very similar or exactly the same as those in the Green Book but things are just adjusted for, for bikes. And it's always important to remember engineering judgment. Any guideline cannot cover every possible situation. Uh, guidelines give the engineering principles to follow and an understanding of the physics and the science behind the guidance. Um, and then you can take that and apply that to various situations you may encounter. Uh, the key here is to understand that there's flexibility in the guidance to use engineer, engineering judgment and apply it to site-specific situations. So this just uh, highlights some of the sections uh, in the guide in Chapter 5 that uh, have major content changes and we'll go into more detail on a number of these. Um, expanded discussion on accessibility, also side passes I mentioned before, we'll define those talks about pros and cons, uh, much more detail on path width, shoulders, railings, uh, desert, determining design speed, and how that applies to other design criteria. There's a much expanded section on trail and roadway intersections, and again, that'll be covered in the next webinar. So at this time, I will turn things over to Tom Huber, who's going to talk about some of the basics of shared use paths. Thanks, Eric. I'll start with an overview and I'll turn it back to Eric who will talk about the design aspects. The shared use paths are bikeways physically separated from motorized traffic. Uh, they typically are designed for two-way travel and they're intended as a supplement to a network of on-road bicycle facilities. They are part of the system. Next. Shared use paths attract a variety of users. If you've been on a path lately, you know what I'm talking about here. In terms of bicyclists, you have adults and children who are riding upright bicycles. 
You have recumbent and tandem users, a small minority, but they're out there. Um, you have bicycl bicyclists that are pulling trailers and trailer bikes, a much larger percentage than recumbent and tandem users. In terms of pedestrians, you have walkers and runners and wheelchair users and people with strollers, people walking dogs. You have other wheeled users like inline skaters and roller skaters. You've got the kick scooters and skateboard users, and you have other users as well. I live about three blocks away from a major path in Madison. And lately in weekends, I've been seeing the roller skiers out there getting ready for cross-country skiing this winter. Next slide. More on users. Uh, first, let's start with equestrians. The bridal trails are best when they are separated from the main pathway. Um, that can be done fairly easily. They don't require that much room if you have the real estate. In terms of motorized vehicles, um, really a bad idea to include motorized vehicles on, on, on paths. Not recommended. However, there are some exceptions. Um, and, and those exceptions are, are certainly uh, people using wheelchairs that are powered. You have maintenance vehicles. You have, I guess, in some states, electric bikes are allowed with, a, with the motors engaged. Um, and in snow belt states, um, you have uh, some of the inner city paths that are actually uh, closed down for uh, bicycle and pedestrian traffic and groomed for snowmobile use. And that certainly is a legitimate um, user type during the winter. Sometimes they're even shared with cross-country skiers. Uh, next slide, Eric. So let's talk a little bit about the locations for shared use paths. Most are in independent corridors. Um, and as we go through these slides, um, ask yourself why they work so well in these different settings. Uh, the major one um, that is depicted here is our paths that are built within uh, rail corridors, they could be abandoned corridors. This happens to be in a rail bank facility in, in, in Minneapolis. Um, and in some cases, they're even built um, along active rail lines. Next slide. Other common locations for, next slide, Eric. Okay, sorry. That's <laughs> OK. Uh, other locations for, for paths. Um, common locations are along lakes and ocean fronts and along canals. Uh, common, of course, if, if, if you have lakes and canals. Next slide. Other good locations along utility rights away and, and, and certainly along rivers. Next slide. And then um, certainly on college campuses. Um, and, and often um, we're seeing um, uh, paths built within roadway corridors as well. And um, the, the reason why uh, paths work so well, um, especially for the first six I cited, and, and often within roadway corridors if, if done right, is that there are very few, um, there are very few intersections and driveways. And, and the fewer intersections and driveways you have, uh, the fewer conflicts you have. And the fewer conflicts you have, the safer the path becomes and the higher the level of services for all users. Next slide, Eric. Paths are pedestrian facilities. We covered that already. And as such, they need to meet the accessibility requirements. There's two main ones to think of. Uh, the first one is the um, within highway corridors, and there are the public rights of way accessibility guidelines, um, otherwise known by the acronym of PROAG. Um, the other set are for independent corridors, the first six I cited. And there are some new uh, proposed rules out there on accessibility guidelines for shared use paths. N don't use the outdoor developed area guidelines any longer. Next slide, Eric. Now on to some shared use path basics. The, the new guides recognize the adult cyclist as a primary design cyclist. The guide ins, instructs and, gu, and provides guidance for adjustments if another user type is the primary user type, design type. Um, keep in mind that paths are frequently used by children. So you have this range of users out there. 
And you need to use engineering judgment when you modify values. A good example of that is design speed, which Eric will cover a little bit later. Uh, the guide provides a greater range of values for design speed, and there's more discussion on design speed. Um, but you need to apply engineering judgment if you stray from the recommended value. Next slide. A little bit on separation of directions here. Most, most path fuel design are two-way paths. Uh, the new guide provides more guidance on setter lines, especially on where to use these long lines. So the solid lines are used where passing is not permitted. Uh, for example, where you have restricted sight lines, you have the low design speeds. The broken lines are used when passing is permitted, but you still have a choice. You can use the long lines along the entire length of the path, or only where operational challenges exist or not at all. Next slide, Eric. Separation of users. Most times you deal with the mix of pedestrians by making the paths a little bit wider. Um, however, separation is sometimes uh, preferred or necessary, and in some jurisdictions just have a strong preference for separating pedestrians from bicyclists, uh, like uh, Minneapolis, uh, depicted in this slide to your right. So if you want to separate, you separate bidirectional with a bidirectional walking lane for pedestrians with directional lanes for travel for cyclists. Provide at least five feet for pedestrians and at least 10 feet for bicyclists. Next slide, Eric. And you want to do this separation, especially in areas with extremely heavy pathway volumes, and especially if you have high pedestrian volumes. Next slide. Majority rule slide um, where you have a lot of pedestrians and they're the dominant form and there's there's many out there. Um, it, it's it's likely that um, that the rules either officially or the official rules or unofficial rules are going to be followed. Next slide. New term for the um, the guide side paths. That's a term that has been around for a while, um, but it has not been included um, in the guide. Certainly, side paths have been built over the, um, the last two or three decades, um, perhaps even four or five decades. The term has just found its way into the guide. It means that it's a shared use path that runs along the roadway. And uh, that was the seventh example I gave after the six um, examples I gave within independent corridors. Um, the side path supplement, uh, they do not sub substitute for on-road bicycle facilities. Um, certainly, just like other shared use paths, they provide separation from motor vehicles. And the guide has extended guidance on the potential conflicts. Um, the, the guide correctly points out that there are operational problems and inherent in side path locations. But the guide acknowledges that paths adjacent to roads are in situation, are in situations an acceptable solution. And the guide includes ways to address conflicts at intersections and, and driveways. Next slide, Eric. And in this new section in the guide on how to mitigate conflicts at intersections, um, it will be covered in the next webinar with Eric and Bill Schulteis. But there's also a new general section on side path guidelines, including the following statement. In some situations, it may be better to place one-way side paths on both sides of the street or highway, directing wheeled users to travel in the same direction as adjacent motor vehicle traffic. This can reduce some of the concerns associated with two-way side paths at driveways and intersections. One type of a side path, most often located on each side of the street, like the above photo in Cambridge, that is, that is a term that hasn't made its way into Asheville yet. And please note that the blue pavement marking there um, should be green. This was an earlier application of the paint. Next slide, Eric. So um, here are some of the challenges with side paths. Uh, this, this is straight out of, out of the bike guide. Um, I'll start with the upper left. Uh, when you don't have enough room to separate um, horizontally, the path from the travel lanes, um, you need a barrier, and those barriers in and of themselves are sometimes challenging and 
perhaps even can create a hazard. Middle upper, often uh, motorists will stop over the path um, at intersections which block the progress of bicyclists and pedestrians to cross at that point or makes it very awkward for them to get around motorists. Um, upper, upper right, um, some bicyclists will definitely still use the roadway. And when they do, they often will be harassed by a small minority of motorists. When the motorists um, feel that, the, that all bicyclists should be using the shared use path next to the roadway. The lower three graphics show the major crash types associated with shared use paths. And, and these are associated with shared use paths, mostly associate, associated with shared use paths that are two-way. Um, so starting with the lower left, and this is the most common crash type, and I'll set this up for you. Uh, driver A stops at the stop bar like they should. They're focused on, on traffic on the priority roadway, either to make a left turn, right turn, or go across. They're searching for a gap to their left at their 10 o'clock position. A counterflow of bicyclists coming from their right will enter the crosswalk at the same time that they see a break in the traffic and move across the crosswalk and strike the cyclist. Lower middle, this is the second most common crash type, and this involves uh, driver B on the priority roadway turning left onto a side street. Uh, a cyclist um, often traveling in the same direction. The motorist won't pick up on that bicyclist and turn left at the same time that the cyclist turns, uh, excuse me, that the cyclist enters the crosswalk. And then the lower right is, uh, is a type of a right hook situation, the motorist and the bicyclist are traveling in the same direction. The motorist doesn't pick up on the fact that there is a bicyclist that is about to enter the crosswalk at the same time that they're making the right turn. Next slide, Eric. So this is an example of a side path with virtually no separation between the street and the path itself. It's especially a problem for the cyclist traveling closest to the travel lane. Not only is that cyclist closest, but riding directly opposing the traffic. Next slide. This is a, a far better situation. I count three forms of separation here. Uh, first, you have the separation between the back of curb um, and the path itself. That green area, we call it the terrace in Wisconsin. but in other places, it's called the median or the boulevard or the government grass. There is also a, a vertical face curb here, which forms a little bit of a separation, um, important at night. Um, and then you have the um, you have a, a separation that doesn't really count in your calculation for separation, but is indeed a a um, improvement um, in terms of separation. It's the the shoulder or the bike lane here. Next. Slide. Last slide on side paths here. Yeah, this is a good example of a um, two forms of separation. Lots of separation once the path works its way away from um, the uh, highway or the roadway. But as it nears the roadway, to get through this pinch point, um, the five feet of separation is no longer there, so a, a barrier is imposed. And that a barrier is, in this ca case, um, a uh, crash-worthy barrier, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in all applications. Back to you, Eric. OK, thanks, Tom. Uh, so now we'll talk about some of the uh, design details related to shared use paths. Um, we'll go into uh, more detail on widths and clearances, uh, design speed, horizontal and vertical alignments, cross slopes, uh, stopping site distance considerations, and some other considerations such as uh, the surfaces and pavement design, uh, bridges and underpasses, and uh, touch on drainage and lighting. So 10 feet is, real, is still the uh, recommended minimum width for shared use paths, although the guide now points to 11 feet as a really uh, good functional width for paths because it provides uh, enough space for a third passing or overtaking lane. So that can really help with um, the, the level of service on a, on a shared use path. The guide also does introduce the idea of using shared use path level of service. Um, that's a, a uh, 
a tool issued by FHWA that looks at path volumes and the split between those on foot and those on wheels and helps determine um, the, the width of a path uh, that's suitable. So when you go from a 10-foot path to an 11-foot path under certain volume characteristics, you can really get a good jump in your path level of service. The guide also talks about wider paths <clears throat> and where they may be prudent, such as on steep slopes, providing extra width, or around sharp turns. And it also states that uh, the minimum path width uh, is 8 feet and can be used in rare circumstances. And those, uh, those circumstances um, <clears throat> include when there's very low path volumes or if uh, periodic passing locations are provided and you can narrow down in between those locations or if uh, there are no maintenance vehicles expected to use the path and that would be uh, common in a side path situation where you have vehicles on the adjacent roadway most likely. The shoulder discussion uh, in the new guide is, is very similar to the previous guide. Three to five feet is recommended with a maximum slope of one to six, uh, maximum cross slope. Uh, minimum shoulders are two feet or one foot to a smooth feature such as a railing. But the guide does point out that if you have a railing um, as close as one foot that it should be uh, flared away once there's enough room uh, once you get past that constrained condition, flare the railing back out to two feet or more. And as Tom mentioned, uh, separation adjacent to roadways, five feet is recommended. And if, this, uh, if you can't achieve five feet, then some type of barrier or rail should be used. It doesn't uh, necessarily have to be a crash-worthy barrier, although the guide does point out that adjacent to a higher speed roadway, uh, may want to consider a, a crash-worthy barrier. So five-foot separation is also uh, recommended adjacent to trailside hazards, such as bodies of water or steep slopes. And again, similar to um, being adjacent to a roadway, if the five feet cannot be provided, then uh, some kind of barrier rail is, is recommended. Um, the guide gives criteria on the height and slope of uh, um, of slopes that are considered hazardous. So at a, at a three to one slope and a height of six feet or more, that's uh, considered hazardous. And then as you get a little steeper, two to one, four feet or more uh, is considered hazardous. And then down if you're one to one or steeper, then any drop off of one foot or more is considered a hazardous slope. Um, so similar to roadway design, uh, design speed plays a major role in establishing other design criteria. And uh, this is a significant change in the new bike guide. Um, the, the previous bike guide really had one kind of general design speed, 20 miles per hour. The new guide talks about selecting an appropriate design speed for different situations. For instance, uh, a lower design speed uh, may be appropriate on urban paths or unpaved paths. And if there is one new general design speed, it's really uh, 18 miles per hour. That's uh, based on an, a recumbent bike's 85th percentile speed. And that's a good design speed for a relatively flat uh, path. Uh, the guide also mentions that only in rare circumstances should, a, should the design speed be below the expected user's 85th percentile speed. And for your typical bicyclist, that's uh, 13 to 14 miles per hour. So only under rare circumstances would you want to have a design speed less than 14 miles per hour. But there are some circumstances that you may want to consider that, and we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. And similar to the previous guide, the previous guide did have higher design speeds. Um, I mentioned those may be appropriate when there's hilly terrain and going up to 30 miles per hour. So getting into horizontal alignment, um, the previous guide had two formulas for selecting um, your minimum radius of horizontal curvature. One is a lean angle formula, and one is a super, eleva super elevation formula. And the current guide still has those two formulas, but they're kind of emphasized in a different way. 
the two formulas are really uh, there to offset the issue of feeling comfort as you as you're going around a curve. Um, it's what we call a side friction factor, and either banking the trail with super elevation can alleviate that, or leaning can alleviate that discomfort of, of cornering. So the new guy that emphasizes the lean angle formula over the super elevation formula, be, really because bikes lean when they're turning, regardless of the speed they're going or what radius they're traversing. And that automatically counters that side friction factor issue, that comfort issue. So with a maximum lean angle of 20 degrees and a design speed of 18 miles per hour, kind of a new general minimum radius of horizontal curvature is 60 feet. And the previous guide with the super elevation formula and the lean angle formula, which I think recommended a 15 degree lean angle, you were looking at and 20 miles per hour, you were looking at about 90 or 100 foot minimum radius of curvature. So uh, the new guide, tighter curves are, are more appropriate. And as I mentioned, the super elevation formula is still in the guide, um, just less emphasized. It's really only recommended in a few situations on unpaved paths when leaning uh, is more difficult or perhaps a bike-only path that has tight, tighter curves, and you would <laughs> that's where the leaning of the super elevation formula comes more into play. Uh, so the idea of cross slopes, uh, again, this kind of starts with um, considering PROAG and the access board's advance notice of proposed rulemaking on shared use paths, which uh, have a, a maximum cross slope of 2%. The guide actually recommends a, a flatter cross slope of 1%, and that's for ease of use for those uh, in, in wheelchairs. That's an easier slope, uh, cross slope to traverse. So when we take a little step back and think about how we were developing our horizontal curve uh, radius and basing that on lean angle, and now thinking about 1% and this relatively flat cross slope, we've really disconnected the need for having the cross slope direction dictated by the direction of your horizontal curvature. And what that means is that your direction of cross slope can now follow your natural terrain or trying to maintain uh, the surface drainage conditions and trying to maintain sheet flow uh, across your path. So in a nutshell, these new requirements um, really make it easier to construct paths they have less construction impacts, less need to build uh, ditches along the, tr the path. Uh, paths will lay easier on the land, essentially. So inevitably, you have to transition cross slopes. Uh, maybe the surface drainage conditions are changing and you want to flip your cross slope, or you have to tie into an existing cross slope. Uh, the guide recommends a transition rate of 1% and 5 feet as a comfortable transition rate. So here's where we, we introduce the idea of speed control on paths. And this is where you may want to think about using a lower design speed um, and then set up your geometry or perhaps other traffic control to slow path users. And you would do this in a situation where you're approaching some kind of hazard or some kind of conflict, perhaps at the, at the top of a steep descent or approaching a crossing, as in this photo. Um, this is a very site-specific um, application, you really need to think about this. Uh, you don't want to create a hazard by throwing in a slower design speed, but in some situations you may want to slow down path users. Uh, longitudinal grades are recommended between a half percent and five percent. And in a side path situation, they can be steeper than five percent, but not steeper than the adjacent roadway. And uh, this is based on the U.S. Access Board's uh, guidelines, um, but we understand that they are considering exceptions to the 5% rule, for example, when achieving 5% is, is simply cost prohibitive um, when you have too much elevation you're dealing with. So um, that's something that may be coming in the future. The guide also talks about uh, how to mitigate steeper grades using um, higher design speeds, uh, also providing additional width for uh, a, a 
for ascents um, and slower moving path users, providing extra clearance areas and recovery areas, obviously providing warning signs, and if possible, providing um, periodic flatter areas or resting areas for those long ascents. Stopping site distance, this is uh, actually the same formula that was in the previous guide. The main uh, issue to note here is that there is a new braking coefficient of friction based on some more recent research. Um, the braking coefficient of friction 0.16 under wet conditions, the previous guide was 0.25. This is more conservative, but with the lower design speeds, um, actually braking distances are very similar to the, the previous guide. Perception reaction time which uh, factors into stopping site distance. The 2.5 seconds is the same um, as it was in the previous guide. So we we'll pro provide the formula here. The graphs on the right really represent uh, how that formula is used for various uh, design speeds and various grades. The graph at the top shows uh, ascending grades, and the graph at the bottom uh, showing descending grades. So stopping site distance comes into play when uh, determining the length of vertical curves. So actually here I have to point out that there is an error in the, the guide as published uh, that happened in, in printing. Some of the terms in the formula are actually incorrect. So what I'm showing here is the correct formula. And uh, the, I know the webinar is being uh, documented, so you can get back to this uh, if you need to understand AASHTO, we'll be issuing an errata soon. Um, but this is just one location where, where there is an error in the printed guide. Uh, this formula is actually very similar to the previous guide. Uh, it's just expanded to show how eye height factors in. Because again, this is all about determining the length of vertical curve. So considering where your user's eye height uh, is plays a role in that. And we wanted to do that so that designers could could use different eye heights for different users. Uh, for instance, if you have recumbent bikes or expecting a lot of recumbent bikes on your trail, they have a lower eye height, higher operating speed. They would need longer vertical curve lengths, um, and this is where you would accommodate that. So similar to how vertical curves um, are established uh, because we can't see through the tops of hills, horizontal sight distance uh, helps us in our inability to see around corners. Uh, we have um, also this formula is, uh, it does have an error in it as well that happened in printing. Um, I'm, again, I'm showing the correct formula here. And this, this formula is very similar to uh, what was in the 99 guide and takes into account um, your, your travel path and then offset to a site obstruction on the side of the path. And uh, this, this formula is actually very similar to the formula in the Green Book for horizontal sight distance for vehicles. So the guide generally recommends uh, that paths are paved, um, but it does mention that unpaved paths may be appropriate in some situations for rural locations with primary, primarily recreational use. Um, if paths are unpaved, they're usually done with some kind of a crushed stone surface, but they do present some challenges, potentially issues with accessibility or use by some users, such as inline skaters, can be challenging. They may have drainage or erosion issues, particular, particularly on steeper slopes, and obviously issues with plowing in the wintertime. The guide talks about asphalt versus concrete pavement. Um, it doesn't really weigh in one way or another. It just kind of points out the pros and cons. Asphalt is typically cheaper. Concrete is typically more durable. One advantage to asphalt is it doesn't have uh, the joints, so it's a smoother ride. The guide does not give one universal pavement design recommendation. I mean, obviously, due to varying site conditions and local policies, um, it does make some general recommendations. Uh, similarly, it does mention considering subsurface drainage, um, but again, that's based on, on local soil conditions and local policies, whether or not that's actually needed. 
bridges and underpasses. So the main key uh, to remember here is that path widths and shoulders should be maintained on bridges and underpasses. So typically that's 14 feet. So for a 10 foot path and two two foot shoulders, maintaining those through underpasses and along bridges. Uh, for bridge railings, uh, the height, recommended height is 42 inches. And the guide does point out situations where a higher railing height may be appropriate, where path users are approaching the railing area at a higher speed or potentially at an angle or coming around a, a curve. Um, you may want to go with a 48-inch high uh, railing. For underpasses, uh, for vertical clearance, 10 feet is, uh, is the preferred uh, vertical clearance for underpasses. Uh, drainage considerations uh, for shared use paths really go back to our discussion of cross slope and the idea of maintaining sheet flow across uh, trails where possible. And to move uh, water off of, off of path surfaces, um, minimum grades of 1% are recommended. Um, however, at times you may need to uh, have ditches or inlets or cross culverts. Perhaps there's a large drainage area on one side of your path corridor and you need to convey that through or along the path for, for a distance. If, if uh, ditches and inlets and culverts are used, they should not pose a hazard to path users. So if inlets are near the, the path surface, they should be uh, have safe drainage grates. Uh, pipe ends of culverts should be outside of the shoulder areas, um, those types of things. Uh, the guide also does recommend um, considering low impact development techniques for stormwater management uh, where, where applicable. As far as lighting, lighting uh, should be used where nighttime path use is permitted. And path lighting is typically done with pedestrian scale features or fixtures. They're, um, you know, typically about 14, 15, 16 feet high. High roadway uh, type lighting is typically out of scale uh, for a path. The guide does recommend uh, 0.5 to 2 foot candles uh, for illumination levels and providing higher illuminate, illumination levels at crossings. And even if you have a path that isn't lit uh, continuously, it's still a good idea uh, at crossing locations to light those uh, areas. So um, with that, that's actually the, uh, the presentation. And I think we would be happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, now we have some time for questions. If you've not already done so, Please enter your questions into the box on your screen. Because as part of a larger series exploring the new bike guide, we will try to limit uh, questions to topics covered only in this webinar. Again, if we run out of time for your question, we'll attempt to answer it and get back to you in the, after the program. So my first question, uh, our first uh, question I want to ask you guys, could you run back through the, the equations that are incorrect in the guide? Okay. Um. There, there were a couple equations that I showed. One was the, uh, the vertical curve length equation is incorrect. And then also the horizontal sight distance equation is incorrect. And do you have any chance to know what pages those are on? Uh, let's see. I have my guide in front of me. I think there's slide 46 and 40. Yeah, but the, the page number is not on there. So the length of vertical curve is on page 5-20. And the horizontal sight distance equation is on page 5-23. And do you know if, um, if it's been updated on the online downloadable version? Uh, my understanding is it has not been. Okay, so it's not been updated yet. All right, great. Now that we get that out of the way, let's get to some more questions. Um, we just talked about lighting a little bit, and uh, I understand there's often guidance for overhead lighting. Does the guide discuss anything about in pavement lighting? Um, it, it does not in the shared use path section 
and I don't recall, I don't think it does in the uh, Chapter 4 of the on-road section. I'm not sure, Tom, if you if you Yeah, there's, a, there's only, yeah, I think you're right, Eric, I think the only um, in inlaid kind of lighting would be at the crossings, and right. um, that, that technology has been around and permitted for the last uh, seven or eight years now. But I, I don't know of any guidance that, that um, that deals or or rec makes recommendations regarding um, lighting, uh, surface lighting. Right. Okay, I'm, I'm still seeing some questions popping up about the equations. Um, this slide, presentation slides, will be available later today at www.bicyclinginfo.org/ashto, and so you'll be able to pull up those slides and look at the, uh, the correct equations which are in the presentation um, for those of you who are still asking about that. Um, but, and I guess the other uh, response I would have on the, um, on the lighting, the uh, path lighting, um, inlaid lighting, is that uh, as a substitute for that, uh, make sure that um, all your paint lines are retroreflective. Uh, that way, even with a um, a, a bicycle light, uh, there should be a little bit of retroreflectivity coming off of the edge lines or the center line. Great, thank you. You mentioned also some uh, discussion about various um, surfaces for paths. Has anyone uh, considered using pervious concrete, or is that included in the in the guide? I don't think we mentioned it specifically in the guide. Um, but in, in our practical design experience, it is something that we do consider um, and, and have designed. Uh, but one a major consideration is, is maintenance for any kind of porous uh, asphalt or concrete. I know that um, a path in Middleton was constructed with the, the porous pavement. Um, and there are just a few contractors as well that, that do that work. So um, that's, that's a little bit of a challenge as well. Okay. Does the guide include any recommenda recommendations on separation and other design criteria for parallel equestrian facilities? Yeah, and Tom touched on that a little bit. Um, there, there is actually a little discussion on um, equestrian facilities and how the, how they interact with the with paths. Tom, do you have any? Any more detail? Just that, if at all possible, you know, you try to separate the bridle bridle trail from the um, from the main use path, and and, and often that's um, a relatively inexpensive thing to do um, if you've got the real estate, if you've got the room. That's the big question. Um, separation takes space, and and often a, on on a lot of a lot of trails you don't have that space. But if you do have the space, uh, often uh, developing Putting in a separate bridal, bridal trail is the way to go. Yeah, I mean the guide even mentions that you know sometimes uh, bicyclists can can spook horses and so forth, and really does um, advocate for a separate uh, bridal path. One of the things that's come up a couple times is is safety on multi-use trails like this. That uh, right now our crash statistics aren't calculated or tabulated for, for shared use paths. How do we know that these designs and guides are safe when we don't have good crash data? Um, well, I guess one, one issue uh, with, with crash data for shared use paths is many times crashes aren't reported. So um, a lot of times we, we would fall back to engineering judgment um, and common sense in our design and just trying to increase safety measures wherever possible. For instance, where Tom was talking about side paths, or min, you know, minimizing or reducing those conflict locations, providing good sight lines. Um, also, a lot of crashes on paths happen happen at crossings, which we'll we'll be covering in the next webinar and go into um, a good bit more detail on, on good design practices at at crossing locations. And, and those would be reported because they often will involve a, a motorist. Um, so I think you're, you're probably picking up on, on most of the serious crashes. Um, and, and also jurisdictions have some sense of how 
how well the path is doing just through informal reports plus also looking at hospital reports. Um, just because there's no um, formal reporting on the MV4000 reports doesn't mean that that there is there isn't either um, informal kind of reporting um, or perhaps in even some communities some formal um, sort of, of reporting that's incidental to the um, motor vehicle reports. And those would be for crashes involving, of course, mishaps between um, bicyclists and bicyclists and between bicyclists and pedestrians. Great. Are federal reflectivity sign standards applicable to signs on shared use paths? I, I think the answer to that is yes, but I'll let Eric um, answer that. Eric is dumbfounded. Eric? Uh, James, is he still connected? It looks like uh, he is. It looks like he is. Yeah. Hello? Eric? Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, the question to you, Eric, is retro, retro reflectivity, meeting federal standards uh, for signs on paths. Right. OK. I guess we'll I, I thought the answer. Yeah, I thought the answer to that would be yes, um, since you know the sign should meet the MUTCD along paths. But I'll let you take a crack at that. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I apologize. I think we lost my audio there for a second. Um, yes, that uh, that would be what I would say. I think that the uh, the signing requirements in the MUTCD would would apply to shared use paths, and I'm not. I don't know off the top of my hand, uh, top of my head, the. Uh, Retro reflectivity requirements um, exactly, but um, I agree with you, Tom. Great. Does the guide consider side paths that are back of curb only, meaning no no shoulder or bike lane and no veg or median? Does that meet separation guidelines? No. If the path is immediately adjacent to the roadway without separation would not meet the guidelines. You have to have the, the five feet of separation. Um, and if you don't, you would have the barrier. And often, um, side paths will be, um, will be quite a ways removed from the, from the travel lanes themselves. They're within the roadway corridor, but they could be, in fact, in high-speed situations, uh, we have five or six um, paths in Wisconsin that are built along um, four-lane highways that are not, um, are not freeways um, and not expressways. But they're actually located outside of the clear zone. Um, so they're, in most locations, 30, 40 feet away from the travel lane. So the side paths can be far removed. But um, as you enter into a city, you know, real estate is at a premium. And, and often that, that uh, separation does shrink. But it shouldn't shrink more to more than, to less than five feet. And if it does, it should, it should have some form of barrier between uh, the uh, the travel lane or the paved shoulder um, and the uh, the path itself. Following up on that a little bit, do you know what what were the changes that prompted the five foot uh, minimum separation between side paths along roadways? Well, there was there was no change. That that was um, that was the recommendation um, included in the old Ashto guide as well. All right. Is, do you know if there's any specific path volume threshold where an eight-foot path width is recommended? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but there's um, that the tool I mentioned from FHWA. It's the Shared Use Path Level of Service Calculator, and I believe you can access that online, where you would you could punch in path widths um, and different volumes and mode splits between wheeled users and users on foot, and you could see what that threshold is, um, where you would get an acceptable uh, or a good level of service with an eight-foot path. You know, I think this is something that worked pretty well for even the 99 bike guide, is that, you know, the 10-foot is the, 
the, the standard width of the path. But um, in exceptional situations, and they, they do cite the exceptions, um, and I don't know how, the, I can't remember the exact language in the 2012 guide, but generally, if you have uh, very low bicycle use and very low pedestrian use, um, and, and, and thus that level of service indicator that, that uh, Eric was talking about is, is pretty high, even with low usage, that you're going to have low conflicts and plenty of opportunities for bicyclists to move around the occasional pedestrians. Those are kind of the exceptions um, that have to be in place in, in order to really consider an eight-foot wide path. And, and quite frankly, um, it really is the exception that the 10 foot is the standard. So we'd like to keep in people's minds that you know when you think of a shared use path, you always think of at least of, of the 10 and 11 feet of, of width. T talking about path width a little bit more, do you know how wide a path would have to be to uh, allow for two abreast cycling in each direction? Well, the operating width of a of a cyclist is about three feet. So, um, you know, I think, I think comfortably. That, I think I like the direction you're going in uh, with that, Eric. You don't like the direction. I do. Oh, I do. you do. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. I I would say that um, you're you're probably looking at um, somewhere above twelve feet, probably closer to you know sixteen feet. But it's not, that's not explicitly spelled out in the guide. Mm -hmm. But there are, in Chapter 3, um, it does give the operating widths of some path users and other, other criteria that you could kind of uh, establish uh, a number from that. OK. If, if a person were to use a, a horizontal curve less than 60 degrees, um, are, are they required to widen the inside of the path? Um, so the, the horizontal curvature, um, again, it's based on the design speed. So the example I gave there was at 18 miles per hour and using the lean angle formula, the minimum radius is 60 feet. And um, if, if you were less than that, um, then you, you wouldn't meet that design speed. Adding additional width on, on tighter curves is just kind of a, a good practice. Um, as, as you have tighter curves, just providing more operating width um, just makes sense for, for path users maneuvering and so forth. Would, would using signage or textured paving to warn uh, pedestrians and cyclists to slow down before a tight curve suffice? I think th those are, are potentially other treatments that could be used, um, although Texture pavements, you just want to be careful that you're not creating a, a hazard with, with those. Um. I, I think that uh, there's two things going on here. Uh, first off, you want to design the path the best that you can. And you don't reach for those kind of mitigating um, things um, until you have exhausted um, your ability to build a really good path. Um, and if you have, then you start reaching for some of those mitigating things like 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 we're mentioning the signs and 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 maybe some of the other features um, but um, build it right first and if you can't build it right first um, then you start talking about signage and so on what about um about winter and ice sheets on pads uh, which can be problematic on horizontal curves. Does the guidance allow for a cross slope to, to follow terrain rather than using a typical super elevation uh, to account for ice around curves? Or should a typical super elevation strategy be used where ice is a concern? Uh, well, kind of how I presented, um, you know, there's two formulas to de determine the minimum radius of horizontal curve. And the guide actually emphasizes one that is um, talks about lean angle or the lean angle of cyclists. So then, therefore, uh, no, the super elevation is not necessarily needed. And um, the direction of, of cross slope is not necessarily uh, wedded to the direction of horizontal curvature. Um, and that was part of, the, you know, part of the benefit of that is then you can now have your cross slope of your trail match 
the uh, surface uh, terrain and it would be better for drainage conditions and, and ice conditions. Uh, I just have a little bit to add to that. I think that you want a really tight tolerance if you are if you are going to be using a 1% cross slope, you want a really tight tolerance to 1% so that you, you, can, you can make sure that you are getting drainage to one side of the path or the other. Uh, that will really help during the winter. If you don't have that tight tolerance and it falls to, uh, to zero, um, then you're going to get some puddling there and you're going to have um, perhaps a, um, an icing up problem. So keeping tight tolerances at one to two percent, I think, are, is is pretty important. In in the in the winter climates, I it, doubt that you have to worry about that in parts of southern Arizona or California or Florida, but but you do in many other parts of the United States. All right, thank you. Um, some communities have proposed using side paths in lieu of providing sidewalks on both sides of the street. Is that approach okay when limited? ROW or utilities present, prevent or make sidewalks on both sides of the street cost prohibitive? Um, I guess that, in my opinion, that's that's more of a political decision of um, you know the cost of uh, adjusting utilities to provide sidewalks and also a, a somewhat of a planning level decision of uh, desire lines for pedestrians and you know how important. That those sidewalk connections are. Um, uh, Tom, you have yeah. One? When you when you start sharing those facilities with pedestrians, uh, you know they are going to be viewed uh, pretty much as as sidewalks. So the interloper is going to be the bicyclists, and you know you're you're going to really want to try to get the on road accommodations in place. Um, even even um, with side paths, you're going to want to and remember the slide where um, the side path is not a substitute for on road. So you're going to want to you want to treat the road, the street, um, with accommodations on road. And if you have side paths that that um, that look and feel more like sidewalks, they're going to be sidewalks. Does the guy discuss trails and rails? For example, is does the five foot uh, minimum separation apply to side paths along active railroads? Um, I don't think we, it gets into a lot of detail of um, offsets from rail lines. Many times that's uh, dictated by by the right of way of the of the railroad itself. I mean, typically the railroad will will control the land that they want. Um, they don't want anything else in. So beyond that, um, path construction may may be possible. But that's a very uh, site specific. Uh, kind of situation. Tom, do you have a? Yeah, the the only thing I have to add to that is, um, you know, generally the 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 rail companies aren't aren't looking to have paths built next to their facilities. Um, so it's a point of negotiation between the rail company and the jurisdiction that is um, that is pursuing the path um, next to the to the rail facility. Um, the uh, the five foot uh, is is almost academic. Uh, you know, in most cases, you're going to have a separation of more than five feet, and um, and I'm not even quite sure if that would be a starting point of a discussion with a rail company um, because the separations are typically much 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 greater than five feet from an active rail line uh, to a shared use path. Okay. Does the guy talk about best practices with bollards or other baffles? Uh, yes, it it does. It it um, again, that's more in the uh, the the trail and roadway intersection portion, uh, which will be the next webinar. But uh, generally discourages uh, the use of bollards as they can present a hazard um, to trail users. All right. Sorry, rolling through the questions here. <laughs> 
Does the guy provide any, provide any consideration for shielding or cushioning blunt ends or objects, such as the ends of safety railings or underpass uh, abutments? Um, as far as the safety railings, it, it, as I mentioned, it talks about uh, flaring those outside of the, the clear shoulder width uh, once there is room to do that. Um, it, guide, it also mentions uh, using object markers um, uh, or signs, reflectorized signs at the ends of, of those types of things when you can't flare them away. Okay. Does the guide recommend separation or any minimum distance between shared use paths and the road at driveways and intersections? No, I think it would, if it's a side path situation, it would still follow the same separation requirements that we had mentioned earlier. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Bill and Eric will probably be getting into uh, this question of how to treat um, intersections and driveways. And um, I think we're, we're beginning to see um, more design guidance um, on whether it makes sense to to bend in paths, and, and maybe in some cases it makes sense to bend out paths. Um, however, the the convention um, in the U.S., especially in urban areas and suburb, suburban areas, is to bend in paths that bend in the paths uh, closer to the roadway at intersections of of of, um, of roadways and um, perhaps even commercial driveways. And I think Bill and Eric will get into more of that discussion um, in in um, the next webinar. Yes. All right. Um, if a road has a curb and a bike lane, does the bike lane count as separation? It does not. Um, the paved shoulder does not as well. However, the a gravel shoulder does count as part of that, that five feet of separation. So it's from the pavement itself, which I assume you'd be able to use the six inches for the top of a curb head, um, but I'm not sure about that. I think you'd go from the face of the um, face of the curb on a curb section. Does the guide offer any suggestions or guidance for multiple treadways uh, for a typical multi-use plus equestrian and or ATV? I'm sorry, my audio is going in and out. I didn't hear that full question. D does the guide offer any guidance or guidelines for multiple treadway, typical multi-use plus equestrian and or ATV? Wow, that sounds like a 50-foot wide path to me. Um, I, I don't think it, it uh, gets into the combinations of equestrian uh, trails and uh, the, the main, let's say, non-motorized trail, and then on top of that, an ATV trail. I, I think um, you're into a kind of unique design there. Um, can't say it, 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 it um, can't be done in certain locations, but um, again, I think whenever you, you have the motorized users, especially ATVs, I think you've got to be really careful about, about not only the design and whether or not that's a good idea, and that should be explored as part of your master plan. Could you discuss a little more, I, I, this question has been brought up a couple of times, but what, what's the real difference between a, a wide sidewalk and a side path? Eric, you want to take that first? Are you still there? Eric? Eric's audio is apparently still causing a problem. <clears throat> well, um, a wide sidewalk is, is really intended um, for pedestrian use. And, and, and often, uh, depending on the ordinances and state statutes, uh, cyclists um, may be able to use that sidewalk. You know, a, a side path is designed as a path um, where the intended user is more likely to be um, the 
uh, in fact, is intended to be the, the bicyclist. And, and um, where it gets a little Whoa. bit tricky, usually, uh, hi, Eric, we're, we're, um, we're talking about, um, and James, I don't know if you want to repeat the question for Eric. Uh, the question is, what is the real difference between a, a wide sidewalk and a side path? So to finish my thought on on, on the side path, um, you know, side paths are really intended uh, for the primary user is, is probably the, the the bicyclists in a lot of settings, especially with the slide I showed Hello. of Cambridge. Hello, Eric. All right, we seem to have lost Eric. Uh, do, do we still have you, Tom? Uh, I'm still here. OK. Um, do you have anything else to add on that question? No, I think I've covered it pretty well. I think the, the wide sidewalk uh, is, just, is just intended for um, pedestrians and an occasional um, bicyclist, whereas a side path, um, the kind of the closer in it gets, and depending on where it's located uh, relative to the street, um, the intended user um, is is more likely to be um, a bicyclist if there is a sidewalk located next to that, um, as as um, illustrated in the photo that I had in the presentation itself. Um, so um, again, um, you know the the side path, uh, depending on where it's located, um, is 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 often. Um, best used as a bicycle facility um, in tandem with, with the sidewalk itself. Okay. And again, um, it, it depends so much on, on, the, on the settings, um, how urbanized, how much, how, how wide of a right-of-way you have, um, whether you have on-road or don't have on-road facilities. Uh, those are all, all factors. Does the guide address right-of-way priority at shared-use path uh, street crossings? Um, it does, and I think Eric and Bill will get into that in the next um, the next webinar. Okay. Does the guide address installing recharging stations for electric wheelchairs and others? It it does not. Um, doesn't get into that level of detail. How do you deal with ADA requirements, specifically profile grades in, in rugged terrain? Does the guide uh, discuss that? The, the guide um, does offer some advice on accessibility, but I would um, actually go into the um, accessibility, the proposed guidelines for shared use paths that the Access Board has, has developed. Um, and um, it, and between what the guide has to say and what those accessibility guidelines um, have to say, uh, blend those two together to uh, to arrive at an answer for your specific situation. Okay. Um, does the guide uh, address using white lines to aid uh, use at night, such as putting a, a strip along the edge of a, a shared use path? Um, I guess in some places cyclists have suggested such lines uh, to help them see the edge of the path better. Right, right, and that's and that's exactly what the edge lines do. Um, we talked a little bit about the those lines being. Um, retroreflective um, so that even with um, lighter output uh, lights, bicycle lights, that they'll, um, they'll return some reflection to the bicyclists. Um, those are especially important on unlit bikeways um, where you really rely on, on, in some cases, lower powered bike lights, in other cases, higher powered bike lights. So it, it does, it does um, have recommendations on the use of edge lines. and as we discussed, even center lines, which would both of those, either together or separate, would help in that situation. Okay. Um, well, it looks like that's about all we have time for today.
I'm sorry if we did not get to your question. Uh, perhaps it will be addressed in a future webinar. Uh, once again, a PDF copy of the slide presentation will be available at www.bicyclinginfo.org slash ashto. That's www.bicyclinginfo.org slash ashto. Also, we will be conducting two more webinars in the Bike Guide over the coming months. Uh, you can find details for that again at www.bicyclinginfo.org slash ashto. And thank you again to our speakers, Eric Mongelli and Tom Huber. And thank you to all of you for attending today's PBIC webinar.